Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, I guess, for some people that might be on the West Coast. Um, we're happy to have you join us today to talk a little bit about um, PRIs with uh, these two wonderful women from Bader Philanthropy. Um, so Bader's been a really longtime client of ours, and um, they have really had a focus around utilizing PRIs as a part of um, their foundation and what they focus on. So um, maybe if we want to start things out, uh, Kim, Lisa, if you want to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about Bader Philanthropies, what your mission's been, what your focus is as a foundation. Um, okay, I'll jump in, and then I'm sure Kim will fix all the things I didn't say. <laughs> um, uh, I actually was the first employee of Bader, Bader Philanthropies, then Helen Bader Foundation. That was in 1991 I was hired, and... Um, We've been around since then and gone through a big history. Uh, thought we were going to sunset and didn't, and uh, uh, created a greater funding capability. I am the vice president for administration, so I always like to say I am the make sure person. Kim? Yeah, uh, my name is Kim Tao. Uh, my official title is operations director. Um, I've been at the foundation for 19 years. Um, so, and I started from the bottom um, as, an, as, as an intern and then just worked my way up um, at the foundation. Um, like Lisa, I'm also a make sure person, um, but I'm also a technical make sure person. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I've known both of you for a while now and I learned new things about both of you just from that. So, <laughs> this has been worthwhile. Um, so, I know, like I said, PRIs have been uh, a a good portion of what the foundation focuses on, not the only thing, of course. Um, so I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit, Lisa, you know, what are PRIs, uh, otherwise known as program-related investments, um, and why did you choose to use this as one of the tools um, for your grant-making strategy at Bader? Well, uh, PRIs are investments, and they're made with the intention of generating um, positive, measurable social and environmental impact alongside with um, other philanthropic tools. They're a tool in the toolbox of philanthropy is basically what they are. Um, rather than giving a grant, you're giving um, a loan, um, a loan guarantee, um, an equity investment, and other type of credit enhancement that's going to help uh, in ways that grants cannot necessarily help nonprofit or for-profit entities in this case. What was important about utilizing that in your space at, at, at Bader? Why did you have a focus in that? So um, grants, you know, we can fund projects and research and all kinds of other collaborative efforts. But what they can't do, it really came out of, for us, the space of creating jobs and wealth in the minority um, communities. You need private sector dollars for that. And in order to do that, we, we sort of jumped to the private sector. Okay. Um, so, wh why do you think PRIs are not as widely adopted? You know, you guys have had this as sort of a, a focus area of yours since the beginning. Um, why do you think they haven't become as big as your focus has been on them? Well, I'll start it out, but I know Kim can give you some much better technical <laughs> reasons. Um, for, from a bigger picture point of view, it took us a long time to get up and running with PRIs. It was before our relationship with Smart Simple. And um, basically, the reason it's so difficult, and I've spoken to many different associations of folks that are very excited and interested in this tool, but they don't land up embracing it because it takes a little bit more due diligence and the legal structure. You also need somebody on the team who understands deal making, uh, economic development deal making, although, you know, once you get into it, and if you have the right tools to promote it, it isn't as difficult as it seems. And I'm always encouraging foundations and other philanthropic entities to really give it a shot to jump in and do it. Uh, but that is the reason why I think it hasn't not been embraced. And Kim can you probably give more specifics on that because she's the one who does all the technical stuff. <laughs> well, I, I think with anything, it's the fear of the unknown. Um, people don't have that basic knowledge of PRIs um, and they don't know what to expect. Um, and it, like Lisa said, there is a, a certain com uh, complexity, more of a due diligence. It, it's an extra layer of legal and financial uh, knowledge that a person needs. Um, even at the foundation, we have a team of people who are working on PRIs um, at once. And we also have our legal team as well. 
um, to cover the bases that you know things that would fall through the cracks. Otherwise, you know, it, it's a it's a legal contract, you know, because they're, it's a loan. Um, they're paying us back. Um, so I think that's the reason why people, our foundations don't use it um, as much. Because when I'm talking to other foundations, trying to explain to them, oh, you need this, you need this, you need this, and you might want to think of this, and it, it's daunting for them. They're like, okay, you know, like I need to st take a step back and think about this a little bit more before I, I step in into PRI making. Makes sense. Um, so I know you've talked a little bit about what you know PRIs can be good for. Um, what what truly what are the or the situations the organizations where you're wanting to utilize a PRI versus a grant and when are they not really a good fit for those types of uh, situations? So typically the best examples, uh, what PRIs are is patient capital basically. They're giving organizations they're filling gaps and things like that. So um, maybe an organization can't secure a line of credit, for example, from a financial institution because they don't have a credit history. So that would be a time when we would jump in and, and, and give them a low interest loan uh, in order to give them the background, first of all, to give them the money to do it, but also to give them the ability to create a good credit history um, so that the next time they can go ahead. Um, a new building or construction project that requires additional funds to close a financing gap. That'd be a really good, that's very common. Um, some capital campaigns. Um, maybe they have pledges from, uh, from their donors and they, they need to complete the project and they have a gap in that time when they're going to receive the pledge. That's a great way for uh, a foundation to jump in. Um, or social innovation uh, projects, structures, venture funds, um, growth funds, uh, equity investments and growth funds, those kind of things are, it can reap incredible benefit that uh, to these organizations that uh, grant funding cannot, just can't come up to. Are there specific situations you'd stay away from with PRIs? Um, I would say that technical assistance, what's a really good idea is to have um, perhaps sometimes, first of all, make your PRIs to grantees that you know and that you trust. And often, sometimes a grantee, a grant along with a PRI is a very good approach because a grant for technical assistance or training, those kind of traditional things that will help support this new kind of um, tool are very useful. That makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think also too that when, when we look at PRIs or look at potential PRIs, we're also looking at the financial structure of the organization. Can they pay back this loan? Um, cause just like, just like us, when we go to a bank for a mortgage loan, they look at our financials. Can we, can we support the, pay, the repayments? Um, otherwise we wouldn't give them a PRI. They'll better be, they will probably be better off getting a grant from us than, than a PRI. Yep. Right. To, Kim, to Kim's point, just one additional thing, absolutely good point is the fact that, um, you want to really support and protect your portfolio. You don't want to just give out loans willy-nilly and have a very large, uh, you know, loan loss rate because then you're, you're not really helping anybody by doing that. So according to, so you have to be pretty strict about them repaying it. You don't want a lot of forgivable loans. You can do those with grants. You don't get your money back with grants, right? Yep. So you're already doing that. So if you're going to do it, you, you do want to check and test the financial, um, uh, you know, uh, ability of an organization to pay back the loan. And well, also one other thing is you, it's a good idea in these larger deals, uh, structured deals, to have other foundations or other uh, private entities involved in the deal as well so that you're, you're not alone and that they basically support, they underwrite, they do a lot of um, things that foundations don't do in a typical way. Well, and that's one of the things I remember about Bader with, with you all was that you guys do work very closely with other foundations and organizations in your area in Milwaukee. Um, because you're all funding a lot of the same causes. So you want to make sure that you're supporting each other to help those organizations in the right way. And I think that's probably, regardless of PRIs, that's probably something others can learn from in terms of how they're working with their other philanthropic partners and not just the charitable organizations themselves. Um, so I know you guys were supporting this before Smart Simple and before you implemented our platform. What was that like? <laughs> I'm curious. And secondly, you know, why why were you then looking for a technology platform to support those? 
Well, again, I'll just give the bigger picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, we loved the tool. Our board was very favorable. We thought it was great. We were doing really great, innovative things. We really felt we were making an impact. But uh, there was no application out there that supported processing PRIs the way there was grant software at mm -hmm. that in those old days. Um, and so when it came to a time for us to think about our, you know, um, getting another, uh, you know, a support for our grant making, I said, I really would love to find a product that could uh, support PRIs integrated into our grant making system. So I, we did a lot of research and Smart Simple was willing to do the project and Kim worked incessantly with them. So I'm going to turn it over to her and she can explain why. Um, so before I, I answer the question, um, it might be helpful for folks to understand where we came from. So we were on Gifts Classic uh, version 6.0. Um, had to look that up, by the way, because it's been like five, five years. Yeah, it's not a bad thing that you got to forget that information. <laughs> no, it's, it's definitely not bad. Um, <laughs> not at all. Um, so we've, we've been uh, on it since 1991. Um, so it was about 22 years that we, we were on there. And it was a very static um, a piece of software where it was it lived on our server. We couldn't um, access it anywhere as long as we're in the office, then we can you know, log on to it. Um, and we had to make certain uh, changes in the way that we work in order to make our processes flow. So. Um, which is, is in Smart Simple, it's, it's, it's the other way around, right? We, we change Smart Simple in the way that how we work, uh, which is terrific. Um, so there were a couple of reasons why we changed and moved to another system. Um, but the main three reasons would be um, flexibility, accessibility, and integration. So in Smart Simple had all three, um, which, which is great, and um, we love using it. Um, so, with the uh, accessibility, we're able to log in at any time, and with the flexibility, we're able to change as many times as we want how our processes work, right? <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, um, being able to integrate all of our PRI documents in there, and, and there are many, um, a lot more than there are in grant making, because um, you're talking about like promissory notes, resolutions. Um, reports, yeah. annual audit and financial statements, and and term sheets and galore. Uh, <laughs> have, you, have you ever been to a loan signing, a mortgage loan signing? You see the <laughs> stack of papers? I just I, refinanced last week, so there you go. Was, my hand got tired after a while. <laughs> there you go. So as many papers as a, a mortgage loan, PRI also has many, many documents that you have to sign as well. Well, you um, have to sign them, you can submit them, because we have a great system. You can. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I think because um, we were doing all of this outside of the system, even like the amortization schedule, we had a different software that we were using mm -hmm. um, to amortize the, the repayment schedules. I mean, it, I mean it's, it, it worked, but I mean, to have it all in one system, it's great because you can just pull up the application, the amortization schedule is there. Um, and we kept paper files. I mean, you can imagine like file paper files like this thick, even even thicker of PRIs um, and all their documents. I mean, I mean to think to go back to what it used to be. I don't think I ever can. I think I ever <laughs> <laughs> well, and I should note for everybody who's not familiar with this too, like when we were doing this with you, when you originally implemented, there was not a feature on the platform to support that. We had to do a lot of sort of custom configuration to really support how those things would operate, how we would schedule the amortization schedules for repayments. Um, but from learning and going through that process and then working through with one or two other clients, that then allowed us to create a feature that which would support, you know, creating those amortization schedules and things like that. So um, for those of you that might be interested in pursuing this, there's actually a much easier approach to getting that implemented today um, because we just have a configurable feature to be able to manage that. So uh, thank you for oh. the education, Bader. <laughs> I'm so thrilled somebody was willing to take the journey with us. Well, like you said, there's not much out there that's going to combine those two things as well. I, we were just talking about that this morning. 
um, Mike Reed, one of our co-founders, was noting that we had a, a, a client now in Australia, and when they were looking for software, they put out two RFPs, one for grants and one for BRI loans. And then we responded to both. And so, um, you know, they really didn't realize there could be an opportunity to integrate the two and have one system. And I'm sure you, both of you, value being able to report on both those things, especially if you're giving them both to the same organization um, rather than separate systems. So. Right. It's a lot of work to there, Dan. Maybe I should have been on the payroll too. <laughs> <laughs> Not letting you go so fast, Kim. <laughs> so what, did, what other advice would you give organizations, you know, if they're not doing PRI loans today, if they wanted to get started in at least evaluating if this might be something that they could support as a foundation or as an organization, what advice would you give them in order to get started at least in that evaluation process? So <clears throat> most of the organizations that I know that are very into this, into PRIs and into this, they all started kind of because there was a deal out there they wanted to get involved in. Um, and I always recommend, and my colleagues always recommend, go take it easy the first time around. Um, try to find um, a revolving loan fund or a CDFI or some other, that's a community development finance um, institution. Um, something, some deal that, that, that works with your mission. and and what you want to fund and um, start with a very simple term loan, um, and, and especially with other um, folks involved. And um, you get a success under your belt, these, all these crazy documents that Kim was just referring to, they get to be like alphabet soup, you know, you get to know it already after just a couple of them. And there's a lot of resources out there in the impact investing world um, for that has legal documents. I think in terms, I know we didn't talk about this, maybe you can ask this question or not, but like even the opportunity of in this COVID-19 environment, um, it's a very good time. There are some things that you could, you might be really passionate about and want to help in a, in a it may be not fast, but you could jump on. There are a lot of endeavors right now um, uh, with other foundations for loan guarantees and loan funds um, that would be a, a good way to start, I think. That might be a good way to start. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I would say um, definitely getting leadership on board first um, is is probably the first step um, to see if they're even interested in doing it before you can spend a lot of time trying to get all the resources and and doing it. Um, and then definitely thinking about the end goal of what do you what do you want the PRI you know what do you want to happen with the PRI. Um, to align it maybe to your grant making strategy or, or some other purpose, um, and don't be afraid to reach out, you know, to other foundations who are out, who are doing it, um, and even organizations like Mission Investors, where, you know, that's what they they do is is re research PRIs and MRIs, and also um, I think there are also community um, community organizations that would uh, help, let's say, like an organization. Um, to implement PRIs if, if they didn't have that capacity. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're just all in this together. So just reach out and ask for help. There's one additional thing that um, I think that foundations should consider in this. I, in 2008, when we had an economic downturn, um, I attended a conference with the Secretary of Treasury at that time was Robert Reich, I believe. And he spoke about, somebody in the crowd asked him, you know, he was talking about perfect storm, terrible recession, terrible downplay, it's gonna take years. And somebody in the crowd said, it was foundation crowd. And, and they said, well, what about PRIs? And he looked at them, what? Just give them the money, you know? What are you doing this for? Now, he does not feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, because um, first, for one thing, what PRIs do and loans, and they, they help leverage the, the charitable dollars. Because as you're getting the return on these charitable dollars, you're actually being able to refund them. And the, the law, the, uh, the, uh, the private foundation law, is very favorable to making impact, to doing impact investing right now. Um, and also, the other thing is that that rotation of funds, you know, that leverages other funds, so you're really increasing the charitable giving of. So it's a very good thing, worth it to, to make the effort to, to go ahead and jump in. Great. 
Well, we've got a couple of questions that have already come in from have already come in from the audience. Um, so um, the first was, um, how do loan guarantees work? Um, and then, uh, how do you record a PRI on your balance sheet and your 990? Maybe differently than what you would do with, from a grantee perspective. So uh, to answer the loan guarantee question, uh, basically, uh, a loan, what you can do is um, perhaps an organization, um, again, uh, is, can get a loan from a bank, but the bank is a community bank or something like that, or it's a group that's putting in money, and they would like some, you know, a foundation's guarantee behind this particular loan. So you can, you can guarantee that. Uh, there are loan guarantee funds nationally. Uh, um, Kresge Foundation has a very big one. It's a great one, depending upon what your mission is and what you would like to do with it. And basically, you're guaranteeing a, a, a certain funds, and it doesn't really go on the books, unfortunately, as a qualifying distribution. I'm going to talk foundation language now. Yep. Um, uh, until the money is out the door. So that doesn't compel a lot of foundations to do it. However, it is a very good tool with very little risk. It's less risk than, than making your own loan. So that's basically how the guarantee works. In terms of booking these, um, uh, you, you, these are all um, done via expenditure responsibility if it's for a for-profit. Um, uh, so that question is a very good question. Uh, but basically, um, <clears throat> what it is, it's part of your payout, as if you made a grant. Same exact thing. Um, and, and you can, it's kind of like a little du double dip, because as you're sending out this money, it reduces your assets as well. So your, the 5% requirement that the government has on payout is also reduced. Um, and then, so you book it in the way back, you have, to, you do have to book it as a, as a credit. So your assets go back up again, but if you roll it out quick enough within a year, you can keep doing this and, uh, it, it's, it, it's a favorable tax, uh, process. That makes sense. I hope that was clear, but if somebody wants me to explain it more. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we get any follow-up questions. You, you kind of hit on another, the other question, which was related to those loans to for-profits and how that would work from an expenditure responsibility. Oh, I'm sorry. I looked at those questions and I should have waited until you asked. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. organized. So Dan, I, I do want to add something into that loan guarantee part in the system. If you want yep. to learn how, how to do it and show it in the system, is that you do have to take it out of your budget already. Um, otherwise, because it's because you're pretending that it's already spent, mm -hmm. so you have to remove it from your budget so that it's not spent elsewhere. But that is a team response. You don't necessarily have to take out 100% of it. You can take out 80%. Depends what your what the deal is and how much risk you feel that you're going to have to take. So you do take it out of your budget, but it's it's not always 100%. And hopefully you don't have to use it. Well, and, and as Kim knows, we've been working for longer than expected, but pretty soon <laughs> to finish um, updating the fund manager or budget manager to be able to account for those repayments. So if someone's thinking about it from that perspective as well, and you're using a budget manager, um, typically for everybody else, they're just thinking about the dollars going out the door. So we're also accounting for the dollars coming back in and then which budgets those, um, you know, relate to once the dollars come back in the door. So um, you can use other aspects of the system um, just in a different manner than maybe what you're used to today. Um, we also use the system to maintain uh, the other thing in terms of, and I didn't quite completely answer that question about how to deal with it on your 990. Your private foundation, it's very different if you're a public charity. <clears throat> if you're a public charity and you complete a 990, then there's different aspects. You don't have to do this. But if you're a private foundation and you, <clears throat> and you complete a 990 PF, you have to carry though that um, those loan repayments. Any open PRI to a for-profit entity has to be carried uh, forever, uh, as long as it's open. So not a big deal. Smart Simple helps us with that because it maintains all of that and we can just export it to an Excel, to our 990 form, and uh, it, uh, it, works out, it works out very well. So I just want to make sure that I covered that because I didn't say that to you. Great. Perfect. Fun technical. <laughs> turn me on, but don't turn anybody else on. <laughs> 
it, one, one thing you're talking about the budget manager. Mm -hmm. um, yes, PRIs do come back, but also grants come back um, as well yeah, when they're unspent. So yep. to have that capability to add the monies back into the budget manager, manager is, is something to think about too. Not only Absolutely. for PRIs. Yeah, it's yeah. a great integration. Yeah, and, and some folks may do like voids and at least account for voids, but they may not be accounting for refunds. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if someone's not doing that today and they've been having trouble making that accounting add up, then that's something we can revisit with them. Great point. Well, um, Claudine, do we have any other questions that you've seen? Um, none so far. Do I personally have a question. How, how do you determine a good balance between um, just grants and PRIs within your budgets? Well, we treat program-related investments, PRIs, as a program area. Mm -hmm. So we give it a certain bucket of money, just like we would give any other program area. Um, now, when we have a really great deal, we have dipped into our corpus to, to uh, add more money to it, because Obviously, the generally more they're they're a little bit more expensive than grants in most cases, unless you do very large grants. Um, in terms of the balance, uh, so that's how you get the balance in your portfolio. You know, you have a certain amount of money. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that the primary tool for foundations is always going to be grant making, and um, it may look like PRIs represent a lot. Of, we have an. It, I think we've done about $18 million in PRIs. We've done a lot more in grant making. I mean, I think we give basically our whole budget every year now is about $20 million. <clears throat> but of that total overall of our time, PRIs may have taken a big chunk because they're larger and they're more, um, but we've also got money back from them. So um, I think that it should be a small percentage of your, uh, certainly when you start out. And um, if you can if you can build it and get interesting deals, finding the interesting deals are what isn't so easy. Um, mm -hmm. But when you do, and if the opportunity comes, it's really the process shouldn't be what gets in the way of doing the deal for a, for a foundation. And that's why I think it's really important to have a tool to do it. You know, I think that would be that's the most important thing. It's not be able to have a process that you can do legally and safely and you know and also creatively. I also think that um, because PRIs have a larger reach because you're also doing it to a, a company um, because nonprofit um, they have um, they have a certain reach to them and, and it, it kind of, I, I think it's a little bit limited uh, for where they can target. So if you are making a PRI to a, uh, a for-profit entity, um, your mission, you know, can be greatly um, improved and um, because they have a, a larger, I guess, base that they can cover because they're not limited to who they can serve. Um, but I, 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 think, I think that's the reason why, you know, some organizations should think about doing PRIs too, um, just to further their mission. Okay. And then when it comes to the financials, you mentioned earlier that it's kind of like applying for a mortgage in a bank where you have to check a bunch of things. When you were getting started with PRIs, did you form your own, um, let's say, eligibility form for it? Or was there a standard um, question, set of questions um, within the industry that you could just easily input when it comes to getting started with um, PRIs and applications? There was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing. Um, basically, yeah, we just, uh, we had a team. And that's why, as, as Kim mentioned, it's good to have people on staff who know how to do these, some financial people. And basically, we're interested in two types of return on our investment, the social return on investment and the financial return double bottom line and now there's a triple bottom line with environmental return but i think that um uh, uh structuring it that way it was a beautiful mix of programmatic and financial um sort of knowing knowledge that that we had to incorporate so now all of these documents these applications these term loan agreements these they're all available 
Um, there are templates for all of them, and we are, we personally are very happy to help anybody who um, is interested in doing this. We'd love to permit, promote the field because um, it's a very exciting uh, thing to do, and uh, it's much more accessible and not difficult. It's not as difficult as it was when we first started. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, sorry. Um, so, um, like I mentioned, it's kind of like a mortgage loan, but the difference between that is, you know, certain banks and lenders um, have, let's say, like a set rate, and depending on how, you know, how you can, um, how, how eligible you are. So each PRI deal is, um, is I, I guess, it's, um, it's according to the organization, and there's no set rate. Um, so it's negotiable um, according to how, how well the organization, um, how, their, how their standing is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's probably the difference. Okay, thank you for that. Another question that I have, why, I'm not sure if this was answered earlier, but when, um, when COVID-19 happened, all of a sudden there's an increased amount of people asking about PRIs. Why do you think that is, um, why do you think uh, an event like COVID-19 um, incites people to think of other ways and consider PRI um, for their grant making strategy down the road? Well, I think that um, I've been doing a lot of reading about this and it's very, it is very exciting. Um, basically, philanthropy can help stave off collapse. Uh, and it can use um, loans, loan guarantees, recoverable loans, credit enhancement tools, which we really didn't talk about a lot, but are, very, are really great. Um, and that bridges the gap for these organizations until government funding or other funding comes in. So, um, and also fa uh, foundations can, they can delay interest payments. You know, if they are already doing PRIs, they can delay interest payments. And they can uh, they can do some interesting things. We've done recently um, <clears throat> when this happened. We had um, when COVID you know took over the world. We basically had a um, organization that we had already made a credit enhancement to. We had given them a loan at a lower. We basically bought up their interest in their current debt, and then we lent them money on a lower on a on a you know a lower um, interest rate. And um, that's worked out very well for them. But still with this whole thing, finding the ability to pay those monthly or quarterly payments, they were finding it difficult. So we've extended their loan. And these are the things that um, David have we actually put a moratorium on their prepayments for uh, a several, uh, you know, several, a, a, a period of time, which will put on to the end of the, um, when things are better, which will, when they'll be able to pay us back. So a lot of things, there's a lot of flexibility, even if you are already doing program or investments. But I think that's with COVID, that's the big reason why a lot of people are starting to talk about it. How, how can we do this? How can we band together? And there are a lot of groups banding together um, uh, to create these social entrepreneur um, efforts to help uh, protect those fledgling funds and those fledgling um, um, innovative projects um, utilizing these credit enhancements and also guarantees, especially because uh, banks are obviously during this time a little bit nervous yeah. about making loans to entities that are maybe don't know if they're going to have payroll, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. No, that's definitely um, understandable. Um, you also mentioned something earlier where you started working with um, foundations um, within Milwaukee. When you're trying to find your first PRI deal getting started, do you think it's good to start within your community first? Is that a factor with getting started? The most interest I've seen from our Wisconsin, I've been trying a long time to get Wisconsin interested in uh, impact investing. Um, <clears throat> and the folks that come in and ask us to tell us, tell them, help them do these kind of things in terms of, you know, just what has been our experience. Um, they are all interested in local assistance. They want to be able to help, um, whether they're in an energy company, a large energy company, they want to help their service customers, the customers they serve, who are having difficulty making, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, that's what philanthropy is all about, you know. So um, I think place-based philanthropy 
we are we've, we've made that decision to bring all of our things together and one of our primary thing is to be we are actually located in the central city in Milwaukee and um, part of that has to do with our belief that you your efforts and philanthropy should be place based to help the people around you and so we want to be where our people are it's awesome I think those are all my questions, Dan. Thank you for answering that, Lisa and Kim. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Lisa and Kim, again, for all of the information you were able to share. Um, I, I certainly appreciate, I'm sure other people appreciate you offering your time as well, that if they're looking to get some assistance or some tips that they can reach out to you to get some advice and see how they might want to explore this. Um, so. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining our fireside chat today, um, talking about PRIs. Um, if you do have questions, if you don't even, if there's any trouble getting in contact maybe with Lisa or Kim, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to make those connections. Um, and otherwise, we'll plan on seeing you at the next one. Great. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye. Talk to you soon.